This old house, more than a hundred years have come and gone. This old house stands so frail and yet stands so strong. Its history is a blessing. Its history is so long, so rich, so brave. Its history is a song. Now sing its works with gratitude. Sing the stories of its past. Sing the history of dear Wellington. Sing it loud so it will last. And pray the words will fly with its message on their wings to carry lessons of its good work and make sure its words will sing. incredible heart energy in this sanctuary and it is something that has been built up over almost 110 years of people bringing their best selves, bringing their worst selves, bringing their joy, their grief, their longing for community, their hunger for justice, their social activism and commitment. People have been bringing their full selves to this space for so long that you can feel it. Its beauty is like poetry. Its dimensions call for prayer. The craftsmanship in hand-carved oak. The tapestried benches now threadbare. The basilica with its cross of gold. The barrel vaulted arch. The stained glass windows rich with flowers. processionals of every kind of march, of marriages, of baptisms, and laying folks to rest. The sacred space embraced it all. The sacred space is blessed. The beauty of this church and the sanctuary has always struck me. There's both a simplicity to the way this church was built, but also a kind of poetry in form and material that I think is just amazing. The architect was Norman Hatton and was well known right at the turn of the early part of the 20th century. The two separate entrances of the church were meant to symbolize the joining and merger of the two congregations that came together. The Lincoln Park Church with Evanston Avenue Congregational Church in 1909 to form Wellington. The cornerstone of the building was laid in November 1910. The sermon for that inaugural message was titled, The Church as a Community Center. The spaces of the church designed by our architect were meant for community involvement, spaces for our ministries to work, to show our faith in action. Being able to draw on the historic movements like the civil rights movement um, that Wellington was so active in, all the way back to our first pastor, Edward Williams, 
who as a young theologian taught black Union soldiers, black regiments from the Civil War on the banks of the Potomac River. Edward Williams connects us to the founding of Howard University. The abolitionists who as clergy went to ask Abraham Lincoln petitioned to write the Emancipation Proclamation and after the Civil War worked with blacks in forming educational institutions. That kind of connection to truth and justice carried him to the Dakotas where he was an agent to make sure that the government treaties with the groups like the Lakota were being served justly. And right next to him is Lily McDonald Merrill. Early on, we had a woman pastor who worked originally at Hull House with Jane Addams. That's another person who's rooted in Wellington history. Now, those are the two that have rooted for me what this church is about. From its very inception, Wellington Avenue United Church of Christ was dedicated to peace and justice. At the birth of the new century, it provided a haven to serve the whole community. In 1916, five years after the building of the church, Wellington opened its doors to the first Finnish Congregational Church and hosted Thanksgiving services with Lakeview churches and synagogues. The following year, at the height of America's involvement in World War I, the newly formed Women's Guild became a Red Cross auxiliary and made thousands of hospital garments for wounded soldiers and would later help traumatized veterans returning home from war. Wellington also became a true community center with the gym being used every day and plays being performed every Sunday night. In 1922, after 40 years of service dating back to even before Wellington's formation, Sunday School Superintendent Willis Baird retired and a celebration of his work was held. Eventually, the church's social space would be named in his honor. The church's outreach to other communities grew as well. In 1923, the Women's Board began to study black literature, music, and art. Speakers on Turkey and Armenia visited the church in 1926 and lectured about war and famine. In 1927, young people from Wellington learned about the living and working conditions of poverty-stricken families at Jane Addams Hull House. Through this critical period of Wellington's growth, Pastor George Mills consistently preached on social issues to the congregation. He led Wellington in the fight against pollution from coal plants, cynically placed in marginalized neighborhoods, and planted the seeds of environmental justice with the Black Skies Campaign. A 1926 sermon demanded that our city must divest itself of religious bigotry, social distrust, and class hatred if we are to save America. In response to the profound levels of poverty and discrimination, the Women's Guild organized the Lakeview Clothing Distribution Center at the Lincoln Belmont YMCA. At Wellington, the congregation distributed winter clothing, boxes of food, and raised money for flannel jackets for hospitalized children. Youth sent care packages to children in China, the Philippines, and Puerto Rico. Recognizing the need for a community response, Pastor T. Rutledge Beal organized 32 interfaith and secular institutions into the Lakeview Council of Religious Action. Easter 1934 brought a message of hope from the pulpit. Pastor Thomas Anderson declared to the congregation, we have passed through the depression at its worst. We have more than held our place. We have moved forward.
After the New England Congregational Church burned to the ground in 1936, it entrusted Wellington with its most precious possession, the Scrooby Baptismal Font. Originally built in the 14th century in England, the Scrooby font arrived at the New England Congregational Church in 1881. Wellington became its permanent home in 1942, and for decades, babies were baptized, named, blessed, and welcomed into the fold of the beloved kingdom. The font held its place of honor in the apse, a touchstone reminding us of the history of God's work in the world. The 1940s brought a Second World War. In response to the bombing of Pearl Harbor on February 19, 1942, President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed into action Executive Order 9066. Tens of thousands of Japanese Americans were stripped of their livelihoods and property, uprooted from their communities, and interned in isolated, desolate camps. Across the country, anti-Japanese sentiment was virulent. Two years later, young Japanese Americans who were incarcerated during the war were welcomed into the congregation, and a Japanese missionary who had been imprisoned spoke at the church in 1943. During that time, Wellington's youth responded by sending cards and gifts to Japanese young people imprisoned in the camps. In May of 1944, almost 200 members of the congregation signed the World Order Compact, a document pledging to end war and work towards a world of peace. Eighteen months later, the war ended at an unimaginable cost. Two atomic bombs took the lives of hundreds of thousands of Japanese civilians. Rather than ushering in an era of world peace, the atomic age was born. The end of the war soon gave way to a new kind of fear. The Cold War brought the Red Scare, widespread suspicion of communist activity, and the shame of McCarthyism. Despite this climate that created a chilling effect on progressive activities around the country, Wellington continued to live its faith in action. As with veterans returning home from the First World War, the women of Wellington again worked to welcome traumatized servicemen back into society, long before the recognition of post-traumatic stress disorder. When I was doing the archives, I felt so proud of the women of Wellington. They saw the need and they stepped in. They were very clear that prayer and personal devotion was never enough to follow the way of Jesus. The church was still active in the community, partnering with seven other congregations to form the Lakeview Associated Ministry of Protestants in 1954. Meals were served to neighborhood children on Saturday mornings. Wellington elected the first woman as the church council moderator in 1956, and the Women's Guild continued its outreach around the world by organizing, assembling, and shipping clothing and hospital dressings for the American Cancer Society. But as the 1950s drew to a close, the church, the city, and the country were about to experience a seismic shift. <laughs> 
The nation reeled from the assassination of President Kennedy in 1963. Within two years, Congress had granted President Lyndon Johnson broad powers to drastically escalate the Vietnam War. Domestically, the civil rights movement was gaining attention. In 1962, Wellington joined the Northside Cooperative Ministry, a group of eight Protestant churches that focused on organizing against the Vietnam War and fighting racism in housing, education, and medical care. Wellington nurtured its relationship with the Lincoln Memorial Congregation, an African-American church. Members took part in civil rights marches with Martin Luther King and Selma, and again when he came to Chicago. In addition to these new calls to action, the church continued the work it had long been doing. Reverend James L. Kidd was named pastor in 1961, and Wellington became a United Church of Christ. Associate Pastor Tom Henry impressed on the congregation the importance of lay leadership, and Reverend Kidd responded by reaching out to Elaine Clemen. I didn't think anything of it, but it turned out that I was the first lay liturgist. But nobody seemed to be concerned or bothered, and everybody considered that to be just perfectly fine. Soon thereafter, Elaine Clemen was part of an historic dialogue sermon with Father Carl Lezak, a Roman Catholic priest from a nearby parish, and a new era of lay women leadership at Wellington began. Molly Williams was named as the first woman to chair the church council. The Women's Guild continued to provide aid to indigenous communities, migrant workers, and patients in Cook County Hospital, among others. Herbie Hernandez became sexton, and a Spanish-speaking congregation began services at Wellington. Community theater continued, and a youth ministry was created. Jazz, folk, and gospel music were introduced into the liturgy. Society continued to be in a state of unrest, which was brought to a head in the summer of 1968. The nation again gasped in disbelief at the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy. When the Democratic National Convention met in Chicago later that summer, demonstrators were met with violence by the Chicago police. In a show of solidarity with the protesters, Wellington provided sanctuary for them during the convention. The church from its beginning had always been concerned with social justice. The 1960s saw that concern deepen into more concrete action while laying the groundwork for decades of prophetic activism to come. Now go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. David Chevrier was pastor at a church in Saxton's River, Vermont in 1969, when he and his wife Eloise first heard about Wellington from a friend based at the Chicago Theological Seminary. We first came to Wellington in um, 1970 at the first church council meeting. They handed him the gavel because they were used to the minister leading the meeting. And he took the gavel and shoved it right back to the center of the table and um, said, no, you are the church. This is your council and you lead the council. 
And I think that set a whole tone of lay leadership at Wellington. Every Sunday was like a learning opportunity when he's so well read. He quoted Freud, he quoted Rilke, he quoted all the great theologians. He had the capacity to quote uh, Aeschylus, uh, John Updike, and Martin Buber in the same in the same paragraph and make it work. Maintained a prophetic tradition rooted in a spirituality that demanded action. The way De Chevrier would say, honor all people, it just had such depth and gravity. It seemed to uh, wrap around together all the concerns that Wellington has had for the homeless, for the immigrants, for the poor, for, for the down and out. He encouraged people to follow the way, to do the best that we could do as an individual and as a congregation. just before Christmas and they were having the Christmas Bazaar and I went in and the church was all this dark wood and greenery and Eloise Chevrier was singing. It was an angel singing, and it just was so warm, welcoming, with this beautiful music. Eloise Chevrier, oh my goodness, what would we have done without her? Eloise taught so many of the children in church. She taught so many of us in the church. For many years, my, ch my children were part of the wonderful Sunday school with Eloise and Pat Dalton. I had done some church school teaching at our old church, but nothing like we ended up doing at Wellington. We, you couldn't find a curriculum. It's hard to find a curriculum that really fit who we were. Their curriculum, they developed it themselves their curriculum, what to do in the event of a nuclear war, and you're there and you're without your family. They were talking to the children about all these issues. Eloise reached out to a friend of hers that was a uh, psychiatrist and um, went over our curriculum so that we wouldn't say anything that would somehow upset the kids. What we did do is we reassured the children that the adults were working very hard to prevent this from happening. And um, bless her heart, Eloise began to create curriculum. And she did it in a way that reflected what the adults at church were doing. Such a delightful person, a lovely voice. She just sang with all her heart. Every time she's singing, and, you know, her soul comes out when she's singing. The songbird and spirit of Wellington Avenue Church. Reverend Michael McConnell arrived at Wellington in 1971 looking for work. Michael was a very special person in David's life and in my life. He came to Wellington uh, under interesting circumstances where they he was looking for a tent maker's position. 
this tent making ministry that we could go to seminary, we could be ordained by the church, but we could be called into ministries in the city, but still come back to the anchor of Wellington. We have chaplains in hospitals, we have chaplains at universities, people doing immigration law. And when he offered this to some churches, they they didn't understand this and didn't accept it. But when he talked with David about it, David said, oh my gosh, yes, we'll take you. And they were bonded brothers in the faith after that. His presence was soon made clear as he leapt into his role as tent maker and felt called to protest the Vietnam War. Heavy on his heart was the idea of his tax money supporting the war that he and many others at Wellington adamantly opposed. Thus they began withholding telephone taxes that were being used to fund the military. Reverend McConnell was instrumental in organizing a busload of congregants from Wellington to Washington, D.C. in 1972 to protest the draft. Michael was a comrade. Uh, that his work with David Chevrier and Tid Moan and others to with, with Elaine Clement uh, to deepen the historic commitment uh, of Wellington. Michael, in, in many ways, helped form the Wellington that I knew. He was crucial in leading the congregation to find their spiritual voices in nature. They began organizing weekend retreats at Tower Hill, filled with prayer, poetry, art, song, and just plain fun. It was powerful to be just a community and not just go to church. We had Tower Hill, and we went to the park for picnics. And you know how we incorporated everybody. It's not like, oh, you're under eight, 18, so we don't care. You know, we brought everyone to the table. That's why I danced and sang, and I had a good time at Wellington. I'm gonna tell you, I ain't never joined the church before in my life, but I had a good 10 years there, and it was great. I'm gonna tell you, I had fun. Everybody was friendly and loving. The church also joined two critical institutions, the Alliance to End Repression, an organization dedicated to ending police brutality and surveillance, reforming prison conditions, and advancing the rights of the LGBTQ community, and CALC, Clergy and Laity Concerned, dedicated to protesting the war in Vietnam. In 1975, Steve Goodman performed a concert in support of Calc. Nancy Pruder and I got to know each other, and somehow it came up about doing something for Wellington, a concert. I wanted to know how to, how to get enough people together, but we needed a name, somebody that's good. And she looked at me and she said, do you know Steve Goodman? Uh, oh yeah, I know his music. Uh, I'm gonna get married to him. Wow. That blew my thing. Well, anyways, it wound up by doing four shows at the Earl of Old Town. The, the joy of having two churches get together and do something that made so many people happy, that's, that's right here. Wellington hosted Jane Fonda, who also spoke out against the war. Other issues were important to Wellington's mission. Church members sent letters of protest to Governor Ogilvie after years of racial violence against black citizens of Cairo, Illinois. The church participated in a boycott of lettuce and grapes in support of the United Farm Workers, fighting for fair wages and livable housing. The church building continued to be a center for community activity. Wellington staged its own production of Godspell, as well as an annual Christmas pageant and welcomed other community theater groups. In January 1973, the church began sharing space with the LGBTQ Good Shepherd Parish of the Metropolitan Church of Chicago, to the disdain of both society and many church hierarchies. Dave Chevrier uh, contacted me 
he suggested that I consider uh, joining a Wellington and exploring ordination through the United Church of Christ. Wellington called an openly gay person to congregational ministry, taking a bold risk in the mid-1970s. When Wellington said, we invite you, that overwhelming sense of grace was like walking from darkness into, into light. At the time of his ordination, Reverend Sid Mong was only the second openly gay minister in the United States. Reverend David Chevrier began his ministry by welcoming tent makers and by challenging the congregation to live on less and give more. The church made a covenant to give 30% of their pledged income to the oppressed. They supported refugees, served in soup kitchens, protested the apartheid system in South Africa, founded a blood bank, and challenged the leadership of the UCC to increase donations to the oppressed in the Third World. The 1970s rejoiced in new leaders, new members, and a deeper commitment to the gospel's call for social and racial justice. Tent makers brought Wellington's mission into the city and the world, and the church strengthened its focus on aid to the poor and ending war. At the ripe old age of 70, Wellington intensified its progressive and maverick ministry. Won't you let me be your servant? Let me be as Christ to you. 